Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. HDIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the homeland defense and security community. As such, our organization supports those working in the homeland defense and security domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Homeland Defense and Security DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Homeland Defense and Security Research. All right, good day and Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, my name is John Clements, and I am the technical lead for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. And uh, welcome to today's webinar, the first of the new year. Uh, very excited to have uh, this webinar this year uh, to start us off. But uh, first, I'd, I'll just take a couple of administrative notes. Um, for one, uh, all attendees are muted. So uh, if you have any questions for the presenter, uh, down on the bottom right, there's a, a little ellipses menu. And if you click on that, you should be able to uh, bring up something that says Q&A. So I just ask that you put your Q &A, uh, questions for the presenter in there. And at the end of the presentation, we'll uh, go over them. If you're dialed in, I'll read them out loud so that uh, anybody that uh, might have called in can hear the questions and answers. Uh, if you'd like a copy of today's slides, they are posted now on the webinar announcement that um, is at HGIX slash webinars. And then just find today's webinar and you can um, download the slide deck from there uh, with. Uh, and then also, if you have a colleague that missed this webinar, um, or, or if you have a technical issue and you get bumped or have to drop early, we will be uh, getting this up on our U, uh, YouTube channel and uh, you can pull that down and, and watch it um, probably within by Monday of next week. But uh, just check back on the website or check our YouTube channel. And the video should be there. So, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce today's webinar presenter. The webinar is on Homeland Defense and Future War Fighting Challenges Arising from the People's Republic of China Activities in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, today's presenter is uh, Dr. Evan Ellis from the U.S. Army War College. Uh, Dr. Ellis is a research professor of Latin American Studies at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute with a focus on the region's relationships with China and other non-Western hemisphere actors, as well as transnational organized crime and populism in the region. And with that, Dr. Ellis, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be uh, here today and on behalf of U.S. Army War College and our Strategic Studies Institute, uh, uh, again, uh, greetings and uh, we appreciate your interest in, in this topic. Um, thanks to uh, HDAC uh, for the opportunity to share my work with you today. Um, as a civilian employee of the U.S. government, I just want to emphasize that uh, while I will uh, give you my frank opinion and analysis, it in no way represents my institution or the U.S. government. Um, with that, I have a presentation which uh, will be, go about uh, 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to uh, turn and, and share it uh, right now. Put it on the screen. Uh, so you should be able to see the presentation, Homeland Defense and uh, Warfighting Challenges Arising from PRC Activities in Latin America and the Caribbean. One of the things I'd like to emphasize before starting out is when we say Western Hemisphere, I'm referring principally to Latin America and 
uh, the, the Caribbean. Um, obviously, uh, there are a number of, of different activities uh, by um, our competitor PRC uh, that involve uh, directly the U.S. homeland itself with respect to espionage and tech theft and um, problematic uh, acquisitions uh, of uh, US, U.S. companies. Uh, we can uh, talk about that in, in the Q&A, but my focus today really is on some of the activities in Latin America um, and how those in the context of a possible uh, U.S. Uh, PRC warfight that could arise over uh, over uh, Taiwan or another issue uh, could create some considerations that is useful for us to be thinking about now. Obviously, there are a number of things that we're not going to be able to go into just because of, of the nature of this as an unclassified uh, briefing, but uh, hopefully this will stimulate uh, across the board some interesting discussion. So to begin with, uh, I want to set the context of uh, some of the nature of the PRC challenges in the region that create these concerns. And when we get to the last couple slides, I'll get into a little bit more detail on some of the specific uh, challenges. And so, um, you know, uh, bear with me as, as we build up some of the issues. Uh, number one, uh, the thing that I've been saying as I follow this for the last uh, about 23 years is that PRC activities in the region are primarily economic in scope, but that does not make them any the less strategically impactful for the region or for the United States or raise issues. Uh, they include uh, attempts to obtain secure uh, access to resources uh, through uh, purchases and, and the PRC uh, company presence in a variety of different sectors, uh, some more strategic than others, including things such as lithium in, in Chile um, and uh, Bolivia and in and, and, um, and, and Argentina. Uh, they also include uh, uh, targeting uh, various different Latin American markets, uh, including, again, some markets of particular strategic value, uh, digital technologies and, and other things um, with a, a number of, of different uh, vulnerabilities that come after that. And of course, uh, it also includes uh, using what I would call multidimensional connectivity. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about the PRC, uh, PRC uh, Belt and Road activities. And while this in Latin America, especially since about 2018, uh, does involve the traditional focus on the construction of, of roads and railroads and bridges and, and the operation and financing of, of port facilities, among other things. Um, it also includes electricity connectivity. It includes uh, um, uh, e-commerce activities. Um, and perhaps uh, most uh, uh, significantly, it includes a variety of, of different uh, digital infrastructure activities in Latin America that create some vulnerabilities and considerations that we'll talk about later. Also important to note here that um, uh, while most Latin American states do not uh, overtly embrace uh, military activities uh, as uh, you know, directed specifically against the United States, the importance of the PRC as an economic partner and as a global actor in, in general often opens the doors for many of our Latin American partners, especially um, you know, those uh, with uh, neutral or, or negative uh, sentiments toward the United States politically to want to engage with, uh, do purchases with and cooperation activities with the PRC military military, um, those activities in turn, while the PRC is, is very cautious not to establish official bases or alliances that might alarm the United States and, and undercut its interests uh, in those domains um, do create uh, certain vulnerabilities that we'll talk about later. Also important to note that um, although uh, we talk mostly about South America and elsewhere, uh, when you look at uh, the PRC engagement in the Caribbean uh, in terms of both its commercial engagement in the tourism sector and the logistics sector and in other areas, but also its engagement with uh, Caribbean police forces and Caribbean uh, military forces, bringing them to the PRC, uh, conducting presence operations such as the activities of, of its hospital ship, Peace Arc, that we'll talk about. Um, it, it's important to note that just like the PRC, when they look at their own first island chain and the Southeast maritime approaches to the PRC, um, focuses on those as strategic areas uh, that basically uh, that merit military responses, including the militarization of the South and East um, uh, China Seas with uh, reefs and shoals and those type of things, as well as political activities and, and economic ones. Uh, in the same way that the PRC looks at the Southeast United uh, States maritime approach, which is the Caribbean, um, it understands that without alarming the United States, it wants to conduct certain activities to know and strategically be in that space. Um, again, we'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, and then finally, important to recognize that the PRC um, does do a variety of different things in Latin American multilateral institutions, including the established uh, institutions of the inter-American system, but most importantly, through the um, through what is called a CELAC, uh, the uh, biggest multilateral institution in the region, 
uh, in which uh, the United States and Canada do not have a seat at the table, um, and uh, it prefers to engage with Latin America that way, as well as through a number of different bilateral activities uh, you know, that involve the establishment of, of strategic partnerships. For those of you, those of you who know, um, you know some of the value that, that we get with strategic level talks or, or staff talks, um, this gives the PRC those types of vehicles for advancing their commercial and strategic aims in the hemisphere. In addition to that, uh, you see a, a number of different things that occur at the subnational level, at the state or departmental level in Latin America, as, as well as in the um, the local level, where there's a little bit less uh, reserve in, in, in Latin America to you know a little bit less concern about engaging with the PRC. These are things like sister city relationships, uh, bringing mayors and others uh, to the PRC um, for you know business promotion activities, but in, in the process really allow the PRC to have engagement at a variety of different levels. Having said that, uh, important also to recognize that while it is uh, mostly about business, the PRC, especially under the ultim the, the uh, last, uh, especially two administrations of, of Xi Jinping, has moved towards an increasing focus on strategic issues. Um, yes, the Belt and Road Initiative is still alive. They just had their, their 10-year forum in, in which you had uh, two Latin American presidents, Alberto Fernandez and Gabriel Boric of, of Chile, um, and then uh, two other presidents who came shortly after, Gustavo Petro of Colombia and Luis Lacalle of, of Uruguay. Um, but in addition to that, uh, they're moving uh, to, to other more political uh, thrusts. Uh, one is their Global Development Initiative, which really emphasizes their uh, third world roots, uh, seeking to essentially politically make common cause uh, through developmental projects uh, with um, Latin American, uh, select Latin American countries, uh, essentially saying that uh, we understand each other as developing nations uh, versus um, versus the more developed, aka United States. Uh, the third issue is uh, with respect to what they call the Global Civilization Initiative. This is interesting because during the Soviet uh, Union uh, period, uh, the, the Cold War, um, as you recall, that the Soviet Union posted, postulated an alternative uh, type of governance uh, economically and, and otherwise, um, and largely ceded the space for advocacy of, of human rights and democracy, really to the United States in, in most uh, circumstances. The PRC, especially with its current Wolf Warrior diplomats and, and the effectiveness of its foreign minister, Wang Yi, uh, is doing something a little bit more um, subtle and, 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 and nefarious. They say, well, of course we're for human rights, of course we are for um, uh, the democracy, but we just don't think that anyone can say what democracy is, uh, nor can we say who is right or wrong. And so you see this globally, uh, the PRC in the name of this kind of moral unknowability, uh, standing by Russia and saying, well, we can't say that Russia is wrong for invading the Ukraine. We, we can't say that Hamas is, is wrong for uh, murdering, um, you know, 1,200 uh, uh, persons in, in Israel. Uh, we, we can't say that Venezuela is, is wrong for um, threatening to invade its neighbor, uh, Guyana, over the Esquibo, uh, two-thirds of, of that territory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the risk of, of China's global civilization initiative, it's bought them a lot of popularity among illiberal regimes, uh, both in the hemisphere, such as uh, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Nicaragua, and, and Bolivia, um, but also beyond the uh, countries from Iran to, to Saudi Arabia. Because when you can't say who is right or wrong, um, it uh, really privileges uh, illiberal states um, who are seeking to get away from vulnerability to an enforceable rules-based international order. And so in, in many ways, in terms of, of what we are trying to do, the United States globally and in Latin America, build alliances, whether it's a cooperation in law enforcement or on politics or, or other things, um, it, it fundamentally challenges those working relationships that, that, that we have. Um, and finally, the Global Security Initiative. Um, although the PRC has tried to stay away from major challenges uh, in, in Latin America. Um, they uh, just put out uh, last year uh, this initiative and recently uh, put out a white paper in which they spell out some of the details. Uh, two things that are particularly interesting about this in terms of Latin America. Number one is in the name of their security framework, um, they explicitly talk about the governance of, of data and artificial intelligence and space and, and other things. In other words, the PRC openly acknowledges that they understand these types of things are strategic with military and, and other uh, applications. Um, secondly, the PRC focuses on uh, SELAC and, and the BRICS as the institutions that they want to work with 
and their security domain. Um, this is interesting because um, although the PRC is present in some of the institutions of, of the inter-American system, what they're essentially saying is we want to do more security work in, in the region, and um, we don't want to do it in the established uh, institutions of the inter-American system, the inter-American Defense College, the inter-American Defense Board, uh, institutions like SICA, the Conference of, of, of American Armies, SOCOFA, et cetera, et cetera. We want to do it in these places where the United States are not present. And so, again, understanding the, the way in which uh, this increasingly political strategic orientation towards the um, towards Latin America, among other places, are, are creating some uh, strategic challenges. Um, having said that, let me... Dr. Ellis, yes, I'm sorry to interrupt, but somebody's just asking about the, the acronyms on the previous slide, uh, GSI, GCI, GDI, and BRI. Can you just uh, explain them real quick? Please. Absolutely. So, um, uh, very very quickly, um, uh, BRI is referring to China's Belt and Road Initiative. This is what uh, Xi Jinping uh, rolled out in 2013, and what, uh, uh, beginning with Panama, Latin America began essentially signing up for in, in about 2018. It's really the historically modern version of the um, of, of uh, what used to be known as China's Silk Road concept or, or maritime Silk Road concept. So it's really kind of uh, China leading through infrastructure its its strategic engagement with the region. Um, some of these others have emerged in, in more recent years. So uh, GDI refers to China's Global Development Initiative, again, making common cause uh, through kind of third world South-South style cooperation. Um, GCI refers to what China calls the Global Civilization Initiative. And by civilization, they mean basically putting out their concept of, of what they believe uh, values are all about. And this is this kind of relativistic concept of, of values that, in my judgment, fundamentally challenges the um, rules-based international order that has really been the underpinning of our prosperity and cooperation on, on commercial and legal and security matters for the past 80 years since uh, Bretton Woods was established. And then, of course, GSI refers to the Global Security Initiative. Uh, again, uh, China's essentially concept of, of security and defense and police engagement globally, but which also includes uh, Latin America. Um, my my my, my, my apology, um, uh, understanding that uh, every DOD U.S. government organization has its own uh, set of, of acronyms. So thanks for the opportunity to, to, to clarify that. Um, what I want to move to uh, now is to talk a little bit about the PRC digital risks in Latin America. And uh, there's probably a, been a lot of focus on uh, PRC advances um, and some of the threats of, of PRC uh, dominance of uh, architectures of, of 5G. But the reality is, especially in Latin America and globally, um, Chinese companies across a number of different digital infrastructure domains have been operating in the region for over 20 years now. So, for example, Huawei, um, as well as uh, others such as ZTE, uh, began in the late 1990s uh, building out um, 3G and 4G, 4G LTE uh, telecommunication networks, uh, Huawei, ZTE, others such as uh, Xiaomi, which is the Chinese Apple, um, and Oppo and, and others are very active um, with respect to uh, uh, telecommunication devices and, and, and components, again, uh, creating um, vulnerability for backdoors. And, and indeed, part of the dilemma now, as uh, many Latin American states roll out 5G and have been reluctant to essentially exclude Huawei from uh, what we try as, as essentially clean networks, the, the challenge is that um, as they move into 5G, the, the types of, of devices and things that they have access to through deployment of Internet of, of Things, et cetera, um, it multiplies what are already existing vulnerabilities. Um, and because Huawei essentially owns about 60 percent of the existing infrastructure, uh, it makes them very competitive against others such as Nokia in really winning those 5G offerings and thus expanding their position in, in associated vulnerabilities. Um, one thing uh, important to note about this. Uh, the um, For the, many of you know this, uh, but uh, in 2017, the, the Chinese uh, did us a favor of spelling out through their national intelligence law that the state essentially said to companies like Huawei and ZTE and, and also others in digital domains that uh, if uh, these companies have data of interest to the Chinese state in the interest of national security, those companies are obligated to turn over that information. Indeed, uh, uh, the Chinese have actually moved against uh, several of Jack Ma's companies in, in China itself, 
recognizing the strategic value of the information that those companies are collecting on their clients. And so the PRC recognizes that this information is strategic and they can legally oblige those companies that have access to this data, including Huawei, to turn over that data on their citizens, on Latin American citizens, on you know, US citizens who, who are caught up uh, in the, these items. Um, but in addition to telecommunications, uh, also important to turn, uh, talk about surveillance systems. So as you, um, um, many of you may know, you have uh, a lot of talk about the deployment of Chinese smart and safe cities technologies. Um, you know, uh, some of the, the big ones in Latin America have been in Ecuador under the previous populist governments of Rafael Correa, something called ECU-911. Um, there's a smaller version in Bolivia called uh, BOL-110. Again, these are nationwide surveillance systems with, with cameras and, and other sensors that inadvertently collect data in the name of public security. Venezuela has done uh, corporate, uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, social capital uh, type of things, uh, something called the Fatherland Identity Card. Um, but beyond these state projects, and one of the, the most worrisome state projects right now um, is, is a series of, of smart cities projects that our U.S. friend, uh, the government of Guyana, is implementing across different regions uh, with, with Chinese uh, companies. But beyond that, um, Chinese surveillance technology companies, especially Hikvision and Dahua, um, are dominant in the Latin American um, uh, surveillance space for uh, corporate surveillance as well as for personal surveillance. Um, and a lot of these, again, are systems with, uh, you know, that are internet based. And so um, you know, lots of data on, you know, surveillance data and things inside of companies and inside private homes uh, from Hikvision and Dahua are being offloaded to servers um, in unknown places. In other words, um, giving uh, Chinese companies a potentially uh, enormous access to uh, companies and persons across the region. Um, in addition to that, uh, you have uh, ride sharing. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Uber, of course, the Chinese competitor to Uber globally, and especially in Latin America, is Didi Chuxung. Um, Didi, especially in Mexico and in Brazil, um, in Colombia, um, is really kind of a 50-50 a rival for that, that market share. The risk, however, is that uh, not only do the ride share apps themselves collect um, sensitive data on you know where each of their clients are traveling to. And again, these are government personnel. These are, are senior corporate personnel um, who may be traveling to some sensitive places, either sensitive because of, of the meeting that they're going to or sensitive because uh, locations that they shouldn't be going to uh, may expose them to personal um, you know, personal, uh, you know, intelligence compromise at a later point. Uh, but uh, what you find is that, uh, you know, again, you know, that uh, increasing spread of, of DD uh, creates vulnerabilities uh, that oftentimes we don't think about. Um, to mention a couple other examples, uh, the scanner sector. So uh, one of the, the dominant scanner technologies in Latin America and elsewhere is NukeTech, a Chinese company. And so the ability to basically scan uh, computers, laptops, other things um, that are in, in these ubiquitous scanners in airports ports, but there are also port scanners. Uh, there are also, um, you know, uh, scanners for, you know, counter drug operations that are put up on, on roadways. Um, again, the, the amount of access that that gives, um, potentially including some electronic signatures, um, raises some uh, items of, of, of concern. Um, in addition, uh, the industry standard for port cranes, those big cranes that you see loading and unloading things uh, in different parts of, of Latin America and globally uh, is the Chinese company ZPMC. The issue is that those scanners, uh, th those cranes, those enormous cranes, um, have cameras and, and other scanners that basically read the chip on all of the different containers that are passing through those ports. There's a lot of metadata on those chips in terms of the technical characteristics and ownership and destination of what's in those uh, what, what's in those, those those boxes. And so that, again, creates a, a, an enormous amount of data that can be exploited uh, by the, the PRC. And of course, as I mentioned before, e-commerce, although for many years, uh, companies like Alibaba were, were struggling and, and provided some, some insights over what corporations in Latin America were buying from, from China. Increasingly, penetration of the retail sector by Chinese companies such as Timu, which also have substantial access even in the United States, um, again, raise some risks of, of the data that they get about uh, purchasing patterns of and even some financial data about individuals. Um, so the bottom line I wanted to paint with this picture before we get to some of the war fighting issues is the way in which uh, there are these uh, China has enormous access that can be used for the exploitation of government leaders or commercial secrets or, or other things, or even uh, U.S. personnel operating in, in the region um, from this multidimensional access to the digital space. 
Now, as a complement to the digital space, also um, China um, does extensive work in Latin America and elsewhere with respect to influence networks. They call this people to people. And again, like uh, the digital domain, it, it's multidimensional. You've probably heard a bit about Confucius Institutes. There are currently about 45 Confucius Institutes in, in the region. Um, for me, the biggest danger of Confucius Institutes is not as a propaganda organization for you know, the pro-Chinese line, but rather it serves as a gateway. Um, if you are especially a young person interested in Chinese culture and language and a career in China, uh, you get essentially free Chinese language education. Um, if you can uh, you know, show an aptitude and, and interest, uh, you then become eligible for uh, scholarships to you you know, for a four-year program studying in China. The issue then is that there are relatively few people um, in Latin America who can speak uh, Mandarin, read the Chinese character set, or have experience uh, with, with China. And so, um, you know, who do you think uh, when an organization such as uh, the uh, Colombian Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the uh, trade, the Chilean Trade Promotion Organization Pro Chile, when they look to hire people and they're looking for people with that language and China experience, disproportionately, um, you know, people who are being brought in by governments and leading companies in, in Latin America to do China-facing things have a portion of that um, their their careers thanks to the the largesse of of the PRC. But it goes beyond that. Um, the Chinese do a vast number of of different what they call people-to-people -people diplomatic trips. This is bringing people for a week and whining and dining them, um, having you know meetings with business people or, or party officials, again, all paid for by the Chinese state, often managed by uh, Chinese, uh, the MSS and, and party organizations, the Chinese uh, intelligence services. Um, and so according to China's own data, um, approximately 6,000 people from Latin America every three years go on these people-to-people -people, uh, trips to the PRC, and the number is probably more. Again, um, having worked this area for 23 years, um, I know almost no one who is a credible China analyst in terms of, of think tank personnel and, and academics who are China facing in Latin America who have not gone to at least one and at least and often multiple junkets through things like the think tank forums, etc. But the Chinese also bring politicians over through party to party meetings. They bring government personnel over. I remember in Bolivia, they even brought judges over for judicial training. In addition to that, um, as a complement, you have the Chinese Communist Party's International Liaison Department with their United Front Work Directorate, um, the Work Department. And um, what the United Front does is they main, maintain liaisons with essentially friendly organizations, among other things. Uh, this includes uh, just about every country in, the, in Latin America that has um, PRC Country X Chambers of Commerce, uh, as well as friendship societies in which uh, usually senior kind of graybeard ex-government personnel uh, who are well disposed towards China um, talk about China related issues. And, and again, this creates an opportunity for lobbying and also for obtaining information and, and possibly favors uh, from senior level personnel, whether it's over changing recognition from Taiwan to the PRC or other matters. Um, and if you may have heard something about Chinese police stations. Um, according to uh, one NGO that, that did a, a study on this, there are about 33 countries, I'm sorry, there are about 23 countries in Latin America in which the Chinese have uh, police stations in one way or another. The issue here is essentially the Chinese uh, leveraging people who are ethnically partially of Chinese origin, who may have family members still in China, um, persuading them not to say or do certain things um, because of the potential negative implications against their family back in China, or maybe even persuading them to be a friend to China and provide certain types of information or, or favors. Again, uh, thinking about uh, you know the well-being of their family members back in China. So across the range, um, although uh, obviously the, the U.S. through things like Fulbright programs and others, uh, we try to work on on a people-to-people -people relationship. Um, the the number of influence networks in government, in military, in, in academe that the Chinese have woven throughout the region um, is enormous and, and expanding. Um, let me now turn to say a few things about PRC military activities in, in Latin America. Um, and again, this is uh, relatively less than what you find in the commercial domain. Um, but just for me, there are three uh, areas of concern. Um, one are arms sales and gifts. Another is training and professional military education. And, and a third is, is PLA presence operation. To me, the key about this, the Chinese are not currently looking to establish formal bases. Um, but what the Chinese are looking to do is take advantage of that open door 
to get information about the operating environment in the region and build relationships with a variety of different Latin American institutions, military institutions and, and personnel that if they ever had to fight a war fight against the United States, uh, including in the Western Hemisphere, they could leverage that information in, in those contexts. Um, so arms sales generally, uh, it's been the anti-U.S. populist governments that have bought the small amounts of Chinese arms that have been bought. This includes uh, the uh, Venezuelan Chavista regime uh, purchasing a K-8 fighter aircraft, uh, Ecuador under Rafael Correa um, purchasing a, a large number of Chinese trucks during his administration, as well as a, 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 a Chinese radar system that, that didn't work out terribly well, uh, as well as uh, Evo Morales uh, uh, of Bolivia uh, purchasing some of the first Chinese helicopters in, in the region. But uh, you do have some non-populist states, for example, Peru has, has purchased some uh, Chinese multiple launch rocket systems, a truck-based system called the, the T-90B. Um, the uh, Chileans were interested in Chinese UAVs. Uh, the Argentines were interested in what would have then been the, the most sophisticated Chinese fighter aircraft ever sold to the region, the uh, FC-1 or, or the JF-17. Um, the Argentines subsequently decided not to buy that in favor of USF 16s. The Uruguayans decided not to buy Chinese uh, offshore patrol vessels. Um, but what you, what really the the more concerning things in terms of, of arms um, is that the Chinese do a lot of gifting. Oftentimes these are dual use vehicles like armored vehicles or, or military trucks or, or buses, um, sometimes uh, engineering vehicles uh, such as tractors in Colombia, even under uh, pro-US government of, of uh, President Alvaro Uribe several years ago, they were giving military bridging equipment. In Guyana, they, they were gifting um, tractors to, to help the Guyanese use the army to, to essentially build roads in the interior of, of Guyana. Uh, the, um, they do this with police uh, as well. Um, uh, across the region, especially the Caribbean and Central America, donating of squad cars and motorcycles, um, 150 uh, motorcycle, I'm sorry, 140 motorcycles to the Dominican Republic, for example, a couple of years ago. Panama just recently uh, received uh, 6,000 sets of, of Kevlar vests and, and helmets for uh, their border service uh, Senate front, for their police uh, service, uh, and, and for their air and naval service uh, Senan. Uh, and including, uh, interestingly, that the PRC has been trying to tell countries like Panama and Costa Rica, hey, we'll give you these electronic suites that will let you be connected with these vehicles we're giving you if you just hook our Chinese electronic suites into your national command system. What could possibly go wrong with that. So you have these issues of, of, of arms sales and donations. Um, you have issues of training. Just about every country in the region that recognizes the PRC has sent uh, people over to Champing uh, near Beijing for short courses at China's N National Defense University. Um, some have sent people to longer year-long command and general staff courses. Uh, there's an army facility that, that does that uh, outside of Nanjing. There's a special forces school in a place called Cixuai Zhuang uh, that uh, have received uh, people. Uh, increasingly, uh, there are countries like Nicaragua and, and Suriname who recently attended a, a Chinese public security a forum who are talking about doing more police training in, in, in the PRC um, and uh, the Chinese actually do send some of their personnel over to some of Latin America's best institutions such as for example um, uh, under the previous a previous left of government of, of Jilma Rousseff uh, the Chinese sent people over to the um, jungle the Brazilian jungle warfare school in Manaus uh, the Brazilian peacekeeping school Seco Pab um, and uh, under a previous center left government in, in Colombia um, of Mon Juan Manuel Santos, they sent people over to the uh, elite Colombian Special Forces Lanceros course in Tolomaida, where the U.S. actually also maintains some relatively sensitive act activities. In addition to this, again, you have presence operations to a limited extent. Uh, for example, uh, in Haiti uh, from 2004 to 2012, the, the Chinese were present in the Minista Peacekeeping Force with about uh, 120 to 200 military police. Uh, they uh, have sent their hospital ship, the Peace Ark, kind of like the USS Comfort, to the region three times with multiple stop trips for essentially military diplomacy, 2011, 2015, and 2018. Uh, the Chinese uh, participated in a recent war game, a, a small affair in Venezuela. Um, they occasionally send their frigates and others to, uh, they've sent their frigates to navigate through the Straits of Magellan uh, to do port calls. Uh, and uh, more recently, also uh, um, raising some concern, they have been uh, not only um, uh, established uh, in, in the open press as having uh, maintained a presence in Cuba, 
for um, for essentially elent collection at the old Russian spy uh, spy facility in Beihukal, uh, but also the Chinese uh, have uh, been expressing interest in maintaining a commercial private port facility in uh, Tierra del Fuego in, in Ushuaia in, in Argentina. Uh, and the issue there, even though it would seem to be a private commercial port, um, possibly what the Chinese could essentially keep in that facility in terms of capability to observe or communicate uh, or potentially even, you know, things like anti-ship missiles uh, in a time of war could potentially put the transit uh, through the Straits of, of Magellan, which is the alternative to the Panama Canal going around the tip of, uh, of Argentina and Chile uh, at, at risk. And so, again, the, the key thing for me with these military activities um, is that, again, it opens up a lot of doors for the Chinese to learn about the region, to learn about key military personnel in, in the region um, that they would look to exploit if they ever wanted to operate in, in the region. Um, in a similar way, let me talk a little bit about PRC space activities. And the PRC has been very open in their official documents, like the 2022-2024 the uh, China CELAC plan, um, that they are, are very interested in expanding that space cooperation. Um, the Chinese have actually been working with the Brazilians for over 20 years now through something called the China-Brazil Earth Research Satellite Program. Uh, they have uh, launched a, a total of, of six satellites, uh, one of which failed. Uh, they have now reactivated under Brazil's uh, leftist uh, government of of Lula da Silva, um, the Cybers program, with a new Cybers launch coming probably in early 2025. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, the, the uh, Brazil has a relatively attractive um, commercial and, and military uh, launch facility at Alcantara that the Chinese have been interested in. They've been effectively locked out of that facility by some of the commercial requirements that were imposed under the previous Brazilian government, uh, the center right government of the right government of, of Jair Bolsonaro. But um, uh, there's some question as to whether the Chinese could now have access uh, with the different attitude of, of Lula um, to that facility. But beyond that, uh, Venezuela, the Chinese have launched uh, three satellites for, for the Venezuelans, um, a, a COM relay satellite, Venusat-1, as well as uh, two uh, observation satellites, VRSS and VRSS-2. They have uh, built and launched a satellite for Bolivia, COM relay, relay satellite called Tupac Katari, um, with interest in, in launching, um, possibly under, under the, the new government, a, um, again, a, a, a observation satellite, Bertolina Sisa. But perhaps the more important thing about these uh, these uh, relatively anti-U.S. populist governments who cooperate deeply with the Chinese in other areas um, is that the Chinese also built and instrumented the primary and secondary satellite control facilities for both of those countries. In the case of Venezuela, um, the primary facility at the Manuel Rios base in Guarico um, and the secondary facility in the southeast Bolivar state at, at Luepa. Uh, in the case of Bolivia, um, again, the primary control facility um, it, it, near La Paz in a place called Amachuma and the secondary facility at La Guardia in, in Santa Cruz uh, department, uh, as well as substantially training those space personnel. Um, and so the issue is that uh, in, in time of war, not only uh, you know having the satellites, but basically having uh, provided the, the technical instrumentation uh, that communicate with those satellites, as well as having access to those personnel who the Chinese themselves have, have trained, um, giving the Chinese potential access to uh, what those satellites uh, see and uh, in, in other things through those nations. In a similar way, you have, uh, of course, uh, as many of you uh, may have uh, heard of, the deep space radar facility in Noiken in, in Bajada de Agrio. Uh, the, the issue there that is run by the PLA and all the Argentine Argentine government has sporadic access to it. It's, it's pretty far away, so the Argentines don't have regular access to it. Um, and moreover, although there's a legitimate purpose um, of that as part of a ring of, of different uh, space communication facilities uh, to keep track of objects going beyond Earth's orbit, so for Chinese lunar missions and Mars missions, et cetera, et cetera, um, it also raises the prospect of, of being able to, to see certain things uh, in space and to be able to uh, sweep up signals from uh, overflying uh, satellites and, and other things. Um, in addition, in Argentina, you have the construction of a radio telescope in, in San Juan uh, and other activities. Um, the Chinese have been in Chile in the Atacama Desert for some time, although the uh, Chilean government uh, prevented them from having their own standalone facility in, in Paranal. Um, in, even in Peru, um, the uh, Chinese since 2006 have worked with the Peruvians under something called the Asia Pacific S uh, Space Cooperation Organization, of which the, um, the, uh, the Peruvian government is now the head. Uh, so 
so the issue with this again is that uh, when we have to think about the uh, undesirable prospects of the Western Hemisphere skies um, in the space dimension of a possible warfight with China, whether it is identifying U.S. assets or whether it is is capturing communications from U.S. assets or otherwise engaging in the exploitation or, or counter space, essentially PRC access through some of these vectors to Latin America space um, raises some, some significant strategic issues in, in that warfight. Now, let me get to the, the kind of the, the core argument that I want to make here, which is um, that, uh, again, um, oftentimes when we look at Chinese activities in, in the region, um, we have these concerns uh, because of these general vulnerabilities. And oftentimes, even DOD looks at the uh, peacetime component. Um, we are very concerned about maintaining our uh, partner of choice relationship and limiting access by other uh, adversary uh, you know, partners uh, such as China, Russia, and, and Iran. Oftentimes, however, what we don't focus on as much is the very real prospect, um, uh, although you know, I, I would say, you know, I want to say 2%, 5%, 10%, uh, um, but um, our responsibility as DOD, if there is a conflict with the PRC, um, what are some of the things that we need to be worrying about from a Western Hemisphere perspective in that war fight and from a U.S. homeland defense perspective? And so here's where I bring those things together to, to talk about that. And so first of all, again, um, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's a, there are uh, in, in saying whether Xi Jinping uh, would go in this direction, I think certainly um, because Xi Jinping as, uh, you know, kind of competing in the legacy of, of great Chinese leaders with uh, Mao Zedong of, of uh, who, is, who is the great leader, uh, Xi Jinping understands on the one hand that um, being able to do away with resolve the issue of Taiwan's autonomy would really be the, the key thing to putting him in that position um, and symbolically representing kind of the, the restoration of, of Chinese greatness um, before the 100th anniversary of the People's Liberation Army in 2027 and before certainly the 100th anniversary of PLA control in, in 2049. Uh, and so there are incentives to resolve these issues. Um, in addition, uh, you have not only growing PLA military capability in you know, anti-satellite capabilities, in, in, in naval projection, in, in you know, anti-access capabilities, in cyber war warfare and in various other, other domains, um, but uh, also one can argue that um, there is a certain fleeting window uh, in which uh, um, you know, China can say, well, we may never have this opportunity again in, in the near future, in which uh, you know, arguably U.S. PGM, uh, Precision Guided Munition Stockpiles, are strained because of uh, still limited industrial capacity um, and the numbers of PGMs that we've given in other material uh, to the Ukrainians, uh, now air defense munitions and, and other things to the Israelis, the degree to which our bandwidth in terms of combatant command and air operations centers and, and things like that are, are, are challenged by these simultaneous conflicts uh, with uh, other things also happening in, in other parts of, of the world. And so, and, and frankly, um, the ability to effectively respond in the context of, of the, the U.S. November 2024 uh, election. And so, um, on the one hand, um, there's a, a strong temptation for Xi to say, uh, let's try to act now, whether it's uh, through a, um, a blockade or, or other activity, e even short of war, but always the possibility for miscalculation. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly understanding that uh, she would also be highly constrained given the vulnerabilities of, of the Chinese economy from acting, um, uh, again, uh, because of the, the possibility of, of a global financial meltdown, uh, the impact on, on the Chinese uh, financial system itself, uh, the possibility of, um, you know, again, the disruptions that come from global adjustments exchange and the Taiwanese production of, of computer chips, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or frankly, the possibility of, of a substantial escalation. However, um, again, um, understanding you know, that balance between risk and, and opportunity, I think intelligent people recognize that there are possibilities there of, of miscalculation. And it's to that possibility that I'm now addressing, now not say that this is going to happen. But the key issue is that if you look at it from the perspective of the People's Liberation Army, responsible people within the PLA, and, and I, during the first 14 years of my career, um, did a lot of work in support of Andy Marshall at OSD Net Assessment um, and, and others, Navy Global, uh, et cetera, McSiddick, um, on essentially playing red team in support of revolution and military affairs and transformation activities. And so I, I, I can say with a certain amount of, of, of personal involvement and experience that when you put yourself in the, the heads of, of PLA, intelligent PLA officers, um, they are not just going to let the United States come to the Indo-Pacific, uh, a.k.a. Saddam Hussein during, during the, the, the Gulf War um, and, and see what happens.
So having said that, uh, coming to my, my last slide, but really the key slide, is that there are a range of things in all phases of conflict that we might have to be worried about in the Western Hemisphere um, were such a war to, to occur. Um, number one, um, again, starting from the early phases going towards the later phases, uh, if there were a run-up to a conflict, um, it is very likely that even far more so than, than Russia, um, the, the PRC would use um, its leverage as purchasers of Latin American goods, as investors, um, as business partners, to try to put enormous, enormous leverage on U.S. partners, not only to maintain neutrality on things such as United Nations votes, but in the interest of, of neutrality, uh, trying to prevent um, those partners from doing some of the type of things that we in the U.S. have long expected that they would do uh, in terms of, uh, of allowing the U.S. Uh, in wartime access to their airspace, access to um, their, their waters, uh, providing certain type of, of information or, um, or, or uh, intelligence collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, point number one is that reflecting that pressure, some but not all of our partners may surprise us by not cooperating in ways that we assume that they would cooperate because we're used to it in peacetime. Number two is recognizing that um, not only the military facilities such as Beihukal that, that China has, but also the uh, things such as dual use ports that it operates throughout the region. And, and you can see those those yellow dots. These are this is my own um, based on public information. Um, you know, so for example, the, the six ports that uh, Hutchison Port Holdings operates in Mexico, the two facilities that it operates um, in the Bahamas, very close to the United States, um, obviously uh, Panama, etc. Um, basically, the physical proximity through ports, through uh, even other commercial facilities. Um, those are excellent facilities from a special ops counter, uh, counter um, intelligence uh, standpoint if the PLA wants to introduce personnel to observe and potentially even uh, attack or disrupt U.S. deployment flows that are coming out of sensitive facilities in the West Coast or in the Southeast of the United States. And one only has to look at you know, World War I and World War II to, to recognize that this is something that our adversaries have done time and, and time again. And so, you know, this would not be some, something new. Uh, there is the issue of the Panama Canal. Um, my, my tendency is that the, PR, the PLA would probably be most likely to try to shut it down the canal in superficially deniable ways. And so it's not the fact that Hutchison operates at, you know, ports on either end of the canal that they would just say, we're not going to use the ports. Um, but their experience in operating in that environment, and frankly, the experience of, of literally, um, you know, probably uh, you know, more than 100 different Chinese companies in Panama itself and working with the Panama Canal Authority and, and having some technical information. Um, there are so many ways that you can shut down the Panama Canal, whether it's uh, you know, putting a, a container ship crosswise in, in the Culebra Cut or, or other sensitive area, um, as we saw that happened a couple of years ago in, in the Suez Canal, uh, uh, doing mining in, um, you know, in deniable ways, um, doing uh, electronic uh, attacks uh, against SCADA systems or, or other things, uh, potentially do doing things that could gum up the works of of, of one or more of, of the locks, uh, you can use your imagination. Um, but, but again, uh, taking the Panama Canal offline during a time of conflict, which again, although uh, you know that is not a you know a, a critical thing for aircraft carriers the, the, these days, uh, certainly um, the flow of, of resources, both commercial and, and otherwise, during that war effort uh, through through the canal would, would be important, uh, despite the commitments of, of the Canal Treaty. Um, and, and again, it's not so much a matter of protecting the canal against a military strike, but it's it's the, the risk of, of that canal being shut down for a critical couple of weeks. And of course, as you can see from the geography, if the canal were shut down, um, then you turn to the Straits of Magellan, where again, uh, once again, the ability of, of the Chinese is it to have uh, you know, commercial facilities or, or other things uh, with uh, surveillance capabilities, communication capabilities from which they could put at risk, um, you know, frankly, commercial ships as well as military ships or even just observe them as they are passing through the straits uh, creates an issue. Um, of course, beyond that, uh, you have a number of different ways in which, again, that Chinese commercial presence could be leveraged to put the U.S. homeland at risk. I'll mention a, a couple right here. Um, number one, those U.S. partners that um, 
have you said we're still going to cooperate with the United States. We're not going to heed the Chinese threats. Um, you know, as Costa Rica found with the not necessarily Chinese, but you know, Chinese affiliated uh, Conti attacks against their healthcare system and, and other things, um, things like cyber attacks, deniable things like that against partners who are cooperating, uh, things like um, th things like uh, deniable uh, terrorist attacks against partners. Not again, not necessarily Chinese, but there are a lot of things that the Chinese probably could or would do uh, that would be superficially deniable to put pressure on partners saying, um, and forgive the language, um, you know, if you keep cooperating with the gringos, uh, we have a lot of different ways beyond just economics that, that we can screw you. And so uh, that putting emphasis on the imperative of the U.S. to think about how we defend our partners in multidimensional ways. Um, but there are various other things. The Chinese have an enormous presence, not only in terms of the port sector, in the telecom sector with Huawei, working with Carlos Slim, as I've indicated before. Um, if you remember, again, the, the vast access that the Chinese have to personnel across Latin America in terms of leaders and business partners, other things that they could not only get information, but potentially exploit um, people on the commercial or, or government side to act in, in certain ways that could be adverse to U.S. interests. Uh, those things that you get, um, you, know, you have questions, for example, of the disruption of U.S. defense relevant supply chains, even as we saw during COVID um, in, in Mexico, in, in the Maquiladora sector, um, the potential disruption of, of food supplies uh, coming from places like Mexico. Uh, again, we say, okay, we're de we're good defending the homeland, but um, you know, just creating an agricultural blight or a cattle um, virus uh, in a place like 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 Mexico that could significantly disrupt food supplies, or frankly, by disrupting those economies, um, pushing a large number of um, personnel, Central Americans and others, even more than the vast number that you have today toward the U.S. border, not only uh, obligating the National Guard and, and others to um, you know, increase security along the border, but potentially also creating more opportunities for the Chinese and, and others to uh, put people and material um, into CONUS across uh, those borders, and frankly, also uh, you know through the Caribbean, because it's not just the land border, it's the maritime borders I I as well. And so you have a, a lot of prospects for, for doing things such, such as that, um, as well as, again, um, potentially the degree to which, uh, you know, critical commercial as well as uh, military uh, communications uh, go through infrastructures that involve Latin America. So, again, it, it, the Chinese don't necessarily have to touch infrastructure for comms and things that are physically in the United States to um, you know, launch from the region uh, enormously debilitating cyber attacks that could have economic effects that could shut down the U.S. economy and financial system indirectly from the region itself. Um, of course, beyond that, uh, one of the issues that you have as you move into some of the, the final stages of, of a conflict is the issue with respect to Western Hemisphere uh, ports. So for me, the close-in ports, like, for example, Venezuela's Puerto Cabello, or to a certain extent, uh, Bahamas, are probably too close to CONUS to be survival for the PLA Navy to essentially stage out of there in, in attacks against CONUS. Um, but when you look at farther away ports, like, for example, um, the uh, the new uh, Chinese-operated port of Chiang Kai, Depending on the the strength of a Peruvian government that you might have uh, during that situation, it's not unthinkable that a port about that distance could be used to launch credible uh, Chinese threats from the Eastern Pacific or resupply Chinese warships from Peru. Again, these are conversations that we need to have with our partner governments in Latin America, not only in terms of how we would work together to help defend them against Chinese attacks and, and prevent their territory from being used um, in the cyber domain and the special teams domain and, and other things, or, or even, frankly, the weaponization of migration ag against the U.S. border. Um, but frankly, um, you know, in, in some cases in which a, a weak or, or China-dependent government uh, was essentially allowing their territory to be used for by the Chinese for bases of operation, uh, what that, um, you know, how U.S. sympathetic uh, elements of, of the armed forces and others could be used to, to potentially counter that. Um, and, and the final thing it's important to emphasize here is when we talk about the threat, it's not just the threat from PLA and Chinese intelligence MSS, um, but just like the North Koreans have sold ballistic missiles and, and other munitions to the Russians for their war, just like the Iranians and, and others have, have provided uh, things to the, the Russians, um, it is almost unthinkable that if we were in a conflict with a PRC, um, that the PRC would not leverage every one of its liberal partners with 
with whom they have relationships of economic dependency, including the Russians, including the Iranians, um, including the Venezuelans, including the Nicaraguans, to leverage their capabilities and knowledge actually to do things against U.S. interest, either through that immigration, either through their partners, uh, through sabotage, et cetera. Um, in the West, the Western Hemisphere, and so it, it's not so with in a war with with the PRC, um, it really multiplies those threats, including people who are already operating in the region with relatively hostile governments. So having said that, um, I uh, the remaining time that we have, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Again, thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, my uh, contact information is is available through HDAC and, and I believe uh, in, in the presentation itself. So for those of you who are interested, please also feel free to reach out after this event if you have any further up questions or, or comments. Um, and yes, if there are conversations of interest on, on the high side, I, I do uh, I, I can have those conversations at, at, at well and we can set that up. Again, thank you very much. I welcome uh, your questions in, in the dialogue in our remaining time. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Ellis. That was a, an amazing presentation. Do have several questions. I don't know that we'll get to them all, but like Dr. Ellis said, uh, his contact information should be in the presentation, which you can download off of our website, or you can always reach out to us at contact at hdiac.org, and we can, we can um, link you together. But we'll get through what we can here. Uh, so the first question that came in is, um, uh, will you talk about how PRC gets involved in the drug trade coming via Latin America? That is how they use Latin America to smuggle drugs into the U.S. Sure, absolutely. Um, and, and very briefly, um, initially, uh, the, the PRC uh, was uh, producing uh, fentanyl and, of course, in Wuhan, China, and initially uh, in, in the kind of the, the late 2018-2019, uh, 20, shipping it directly via U.S. Uh, Postal Service uh, to, to the U.S. Um, we especially, uh, and I was working at, at State at the, at, at, at the time uh, on the policy planning staff of Secretary Pompeo, um, there was a lot of, of U.S. pressure, and in part responding to that pressure, the Chinese uh, began moving uh, control some of those direct shipments, um, and that was when you had the rise of, of shipments through Mexico. So groups, uh, specifically the Sinaloa and Jalisco Nueva Generacion cartel, uh, that long time had uh, drug and other ties for, and also ties for synthetic uh, drugs such as um, such as methamphetamines, uh, began importing uh, not only uh, fentanyl, but also the components of, of fentanyl and essentially assembling them in pill presses in places like Sinaloa and then spreading them across the, the U.S. border. And so um, part of the issue is there are a lot of different uh, chemical companies and the Chinese, like in other areas, are not in any great hurry to cooperate uh, with the U.S. or the Mexicans, uh, you know, if it's uh, something that is strategically benefiting them until it becomes such a strategic liability that they say, okay, reluctantly we'll cooperate. And that's what we've seen right now. There is some cooperation in response to that pressure because we've made it such a big issue, um, but it is reluctant cooperation. But beyond that, um, a broader issue I think it's important to address is the, the effects of, of transnational organized crime. And so with the legitimate infrastructures in the region with, with China, you also have uh, increasing problems with uh, illegitimate. Uh, so for example, um, you have of, uh, Chinese banking operations, uh, you know, not just uh, China Development Bank and and uh, China XM, but um, you know, China Commercial, uh, uh, China Construction Bank, ICBC, and and others. And so um, there's a great uh, report that was put out by Florida International University on on this, uh, talking about um, uh, uh, Li Zhizhi and, and flying money, the way in which uh, the, the Chinese have actually begun to use uh, their uh, gangs who have presence within the United States, within Mexico, and other places, um, and their financial institutions. Uh, to, to basically help um, narco traffickers and, and others launder money in ways that gives them much better margins, much lower risk, um, and uh, in, in this much faster, making this much harder for those of us working with uh, financial uh, intelligence uh, organizations and others to, to, to go after the money. So especially in Mexico, but across the region, this is um, so th this has become a pretty big deal. Uh, and of course, you also have you know trade based money laundering that involves uh, the, the, the Chinese in collaboration with other organizations, um, and to a certain degree, you. You have um, the, the Chinese use of of their communities to do human smuggling. We've seen um, you know some of the Chinese uh, coming in uh, through Ecuador uh, as well as uh, through the through the Caribbean, um, basically hidden in those Chinese communities and making their way up to the U.S. border. I think uh, intercepts both in the Darien and as well as uh, by um, by um, you know, um, you know, by uh, you know our you know uh, homeland security has has been at record levels. Although only about five thousand, which uh, you know within the context of you know millions is is not a lot, but but that's still a lot of of, of 
you know, military age Chinese that one might want to be uh, wor worried about. And so there is that dimension too. There's some dimensions of, of the, the Chinese use of those communities for doing micro money laundering through local businesses and casinos, especially through the Caribbean. Um, but the drug piece, as you alluded to, is principally Jalisco Nueva Generacion um, and, uh, and Sinaloa, um, principally through Mexico now, although uh, it's um, there are uh, other pieces that well. And the other thing I, I should mention very briefly is that also uh, the purchasers of many of the proceeds of illegal mining, not only gold, but, but other things are oftentimes Chinese consolidators that operate in the region, ultimately for Chinese clients. Uh, in addition to that, uh, and including in places like the interior of Suriname and Guyana, as well as Venezuela and in, in Colombia, and also um, the exotic wildlife trade. So everything from butterflies to jaguar teeth to, to certain types of, you know, the swim bladders of a certain type of fish. Um, um, those purchasers and that demand and in some of those those illicit chains uh, through the region oftentimes involves uh, the Chinese and ultimately Chinese consumers. So I'll stop there, but it's, it's a great and very important question. It's something that doesn't get enough attention. All right, thank you so much. And uh, next question is, are there similar concerns over host nation access or control of space infrastructure in Bolivia and Venezuela like Argentina? No, absolutely, it's 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 a different it's a different nature of of the beast. Whereas in Argentina, you have an ongoing operation by you know members of I, I believe the uh, you know, the Chinese Strategic Rocket Forces, certainly the the PLA and 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 a Chinese gov and, and an Argentine government that is not physically present all the, all the time to supervise what's going on in that facility. Whereas in Bolivia, tech, in both Bolivia and Venezuela, it's it's their own facility. Um, I, I don't have public information as to whether you you don't have Chinese technicians who are still present in, in, in those facilities. But um, again, it's it's a different type of access because there you have um, governments hostile to the United States, probably willing to work with the PRC in time of war with people who are friendly to and trained you know, technicians who were trained in the PRC. Although, you know, certainly technicians that might not believe in what's going on with, with the Chinese and might want to help us as well. Um, but so it's a, it, it's less of a risk directly by Chinese operation and rather a risk of Chinese access to personnel of a hostile government in facilities that are collecting data in, in certain orbits, uh, maybe uh, close to or, or, or of interest to the United States. All right, thank you so much, sir. And uh, with that, I mean, we're, we're just a little past one o'clock now, so I think what we'll have to do is end it here. There are a few more questions, which I have captured uh, that weren't able to be answered, but we're, we are starting to also lose attendees as people are coming to their one o'clock meeting time. So uh, really appreciate everybody's participation. But Dr. Ellis, thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. Uh, I can tell that the uh, community really enjoyed it and uh, it was very enlightening. So thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. I wish everyone the best in, in their missions. I just actually put in the chat my uh, U.S. government uh, email. Um, I have a, a sipper, which I didn't put in there, but uh, please reach out to me uh, officially if you're interested in having a different talk. I also put my uh, my cell phone in, in WhatsApp. Uh, again, uh, please distribute uh, uh, in a limited fashion, but um, but please do reach out if you are interested in following, uh, following up on this. And again, thank you very much for your time and attention, uh, and thanks to H uh, HDAC for the opportunity to, to do this today. Great. Thank you, sir. Have a great one, everyone.